It is my pleasure to introduce Ani Aloyan, Assistant Professor in the Department of Biostatistics, uh, talking about biomarkers uh, and estimating them from imaging. So Ani, please take it away. Uh, thank you for the invitation and um, for the nice introduction, Jason. I'm um, excited uh, to be here and uh, talk a little bit about my research. I will try to give a very brief uh, overview of some of my work in um, fMRI data analysis, and uh, also uh, the work of my lab in uh, biomarker estimation, particularly for um, longitudinal data. So uh, the first question that I think about when thinking uh, of estimation of biomarkers is, of course, related to what is the goal of the analysis. Uh, perhaps this would be the first thing we think about for any statistical analysis in general. Uh, but uh, in the context of biomarker estimation, uh, there are different types of uh, problems that we generally think about. Of course, this is just a very um, uh, general description of the topics and some of the more commonly seen issues that arise in this context, uh, but it is a very much of, of a non-exhaustive list. Uh, so some of the general questions that I've encountered with these type of um, analysis are uh, comparisons between different disease groups or different subtypes of um, uh, particular disease or uh, comparing, uh, you know, for example, uh, neurotypical individuals with um, people who have some kind of a neurological disorder. Uh, of course, a very major uh, role is uh, plays the treatment effect estimation. So um, is there an uh, effect of uh, or evaluation of the treatment effect when we are looking at a particular disease population? And then um, uh, I put as a kind of a combined uh, issue of classification and prediction. This is um, a slightly different. So we may, uh, for example, we, uh, you know, one may be interested in knowing what will happen with like clinical um, performance of somebody who has Alzheimer's disease after like two years uh, by using their data collected at uh, one particular visit or during a collection of visits. So trying to predict uh, something for uh, participants uh, in the future survival is another very major uh, outcome that we think about in, in prediction type questions. And then classification. So if we have imaging from a participant, can we uh, identify their disease status uh, or can we identify their disease status in the future? Uh, so depending on which question we're looking at and which problem, um, what, what is the goal? Uh, of course, our estimation procedures and our um, uh, follow-up analysis would be different, right? Um, so a little bit about uh, my work in specifically in fMRI. Uh, when I started uh, working in uh, neuroscience in general or uh, and neuroimaging uh, several years ago now, um, I started with um, looking at analysis of fMRI data in the context of dimension reduction. So prior to, to that, um, I worked on um, independent component analysis problems. Uh, this is a dimension reduction technique uh, that is uh, used in neuroimaging uh, to estimate underlying unknown brain networks from fMRI bolt signals. This can be done. So um, it was introduced in 2001 uh, by Calhoun and others for analysis of uh, groups of subjects uh, to estimate underlying common brain networks for the group and individual subject level um, weight, weights for each network uh, that would show uh, the engagement of the network over time for that particular subject. Uh, since then, these methods have been used very extensively to um, uh, to find whether there are differences in these engagements between different groups, uh, to find whether there are the differences in the net underlying networks uh, and in many other contexts. So I worked on these problems in the beginning from uh, kind of two, uh, point, two points of view. One was developing methods that would be a, a computationally um, faster and scalable uh, that could be used to analyze data from hundreds of subjects uh, instead of the uh, 
uh, like less than 100 subjects that we, uh, we would be able to analyze at the time by using available methods. Uh, and then by developing methods that would be more robust uh, to data issues such as outliers and um, other types of issues. Uh, so I, um, another um, topic that I worked on that is somewhat related to this is estimation of functional connectivity and then use of uh, these um, results for prediction purposes so uh, and classification purposes. So this one project uh, that uh, we did when I was at Johns Hopkins as a postdoc postdoctoral fellow was uh, a part of the ADHD 200 competition. Uh, where the goal was to um, develop algorithms or machines to uh, classify subjects as ADHD versus control uh, using uh, testing data, uh, a training data set that they provided. And then uh, the competition organizers had a test data set where we did not know the diagnosis of the participants. And we had to use uh, the machines that we built to predict the diagnosis. Uh, so that was a really fun, uh, 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 a really fun experiment that we participated in as a group of statisticians. Most of the groups participating in this competition were in other, um, like, um, in, in other fields. Uh, and um, so uh, we spent a few months uh, cleaning the data, about one month uh, working on methods development. And, um, yeah, and then the fun part was that we won the competition. So uh, that was in 2011. Um, and uh, so since then, of course, uh, we have looked at that data set briefly, but, uh, that, uh, but, but of course, there are some, a lot of issues with the quality of the data uh, related to the data being, having been collected in different sites and um, having some inconsistencies across the, the, uh, the, uh, the sites in terms of data quality. Uh, in terms of the functional connectivity estimation. So um, recently uh, we submitted a paper uh, that's also posted on archive. So this was a collaboration with uh, Jerome uh, Sainz at uh, Neuroscience and, and um, Ellie Apal in the computer science department and uh, Nathan uh, Tong, who is a student in the computer science department, uh, um, did a lot of the work on this paper. So we developed methods for computationally scalable um, uh, approach for computationally scalable approach for estimation of, of brain functional connectivity. And uh, uh, so the uh, idea here is again to develop robust methods that are based on using uh, information of st structural connectivity uh, when estimating functional connectivity. So we showed that this is um, uh, a scalable approach and um, provides uh, a, really a really nice estimation uh, procedure without uh, having issues with like outlier effects and such. Uh, so a little bit more on like clinical um, relevance of some of the biomarker work that was done in my group. Uh, so this was in the context of analyzing. So one uh, one area um, has been in the context of analyzing MRI structural MRI data from people who have multiple sclerosis, and the other is for analyzing. Um, computed tomography, CT imaging for people with lung cancer. Uh, so I wanted to mention uh, this particular project, uh, which is looking at um, lesion development trajectories over time. So this is where it is very important to look at longitudinal imaging. So the goal of the analysis here uh, was to use this data set that was collected over several years from 2000 to 2008 in this case uh, in, at the NIH. Uh, where the subject subjects came in for, um, I think the average number of visits was something like 20 for many different uh, data collection visits and uh, MRIs of their brain have been, were collected at each visit. And we were interested in looking at the lesion trajectories over time. Uh, so looking at before the lesion appearance and after the lesion appearance and how the tissue changes over time. Uh, so. Uh, looking at this from the intensity, uh, from the voxel intensity point of view, that meant that meant looking at the intensities over time uh, for each particular voxel in the brain. So those ended up being these time series that we needed to analyze. Uh, so we used dimension reduction. So in this case, this was um, 
uh, multi-level functional principal component analysis uh, for uh, reducing the dimension of the data to estimate one biomarker value per person. Uh, and when, so in the bottom of the plot here, you can see uh, the colored image of the one lesion in the brain that appeared at this, um, at the third visit of this participant. And uh, the colored image shows uh, the colors correspond to the values of the biomarker that we were able to estimate by using this complicated dimension reduction technique. And what we found is that by uh, showing these results to a neurologist and a radiologist, they were able to look at these results and uh, connect them with some of their, what they would expect to see in terms of um, repair of the tissues over time uh, of, for those participants. Uh, so uh, after doing these evaluations, we, were, uh, we could say that the uh, method was able to estimate a clinically relevant biomarker. And in the secondary analysis, we looked at using this biomarker as an outcome in a regression model where we used treat, where we were interested in looking at the treatment effect and uh, controlling for effects of various other variables such, such as the age, um, a distance to boundary of a voxel for, uh, for boundary of the region of the voxel, uh, the uh, subtype of MS, uh, steroid use, and the male gender here and the treatment. So um, we found that uh, this biomarker was actually useful in terms of evaluating the different uh, the uh, treatment effects uh, in this population. And these were observational data not uh, collected particularly for this study. We uh, went back to the uh, NIH database and pulled the data from there. Uh, and the, uh, this other uh, topic is in uh, the general uh, area of radiomics. Uh, so we are worked on this project from uh, for a few years now from uh, different uh, looking at the problem from different ways. Uh, so it just a general overview of what we mean uh, by radiomics. So this is estimation of numerous imaging features or biomarkers that can be subsequently used uh, to predict clinical outcomes. So in this particular case, the question was estimating uh, measures of so-called tumor heterogeneity in cancer, uh, in lung cancer, to predict survival from the cancer. And um, so uh, for, for, the, uh, for this particular project in this paper, we uh, use um, a statistical classification technique to classify voxels in the tumor uh, into different classes that where the summaries of those classes were, we found that those were useful for predicting survival. Uh, so different types of methods are generally used for uh, classifying tumor heter heterogeneity. Some of those include shape features of the tumors, volume features of the tumors, and then uh, in, uh, describing the tumor, in, uh, the voxel intensity histograms um, are the, the so-called histogram techniques. So, um, then, uh, of course, with the interest in Alzheimer's disease, um, I had to mention uh, our work um, recently on the LEAD study. This is the longitudinal early onset Alzheimer's disease study, where the goal, so for those of you who are interested in Alzheimer's disease, um, I think uh, you will be familiar with the ADNI data set. Uh, so this is, this study is somewhat similar to the ADNI study, except here the focuses more on early onset Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so the goal here is to develop a very large uh, database that will be publicly available, uh, that will include participants who are cognitively normal, uh, those who have early onset Alzheimer's disease, amyloid positive, and those who have uh, amyloid negative, but um, uh, 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 who are amyloid negative, but are cognitively impaired. So we uh, call those early onset non-AD. Non participants. And the goals of the, uh, of the study are to compare the disease trajectories between early onset and late onset uh, groups uh, to find uh, if there are any biomarkers from uh, imaging, clinical or genetic data uh, that can be uh, used for differentiating between the groups. And of course, most impo importantly, that can be used down the line for clinical trials. Uh, of course, in AD, we know drug development is uh, in the news all the time. So uh, this, this is very important to have 
uh, biomarkers that can be used in clinical trials. So that's what the goal of this particular observational study is. Uh, so at this point, the study is still in the uh, process of data collection. Um, a large part of the data set has already been collected, but the uh, study is still ongoing. Uh, we are already looking at some of the data here. And um, for example, one recent uh, finding that we uh, had by looking at the micro hemorrhages was that there, uh, it appears that the uh, load of the micro hemorrhages is higher in those who have early onset AD compared to their um, uh, cognitively normal um, and uh, EO non-AD peers. Uh, so uh, I, I, again, the study is longitudinal. Uh, so each participant is scanned um, at this point yearly up to uh, two or three years, depending on the group. But uh, the study may, um, you know, uh, keeps kind of um, uh, going uh, with uh, uh, as the time uh, kind of continues. So um, we will be looking at the longitudinal trajectories of development. It is in terms of methods, of course, we use different types of methods for analysis uh, when we're looking at the just the baseline cross-sectional comparisons or when we're looking longitudinal trajectories. Uh, and here, uh, so uh, the bi biostatistics department uh, at Brown, um, in the biostatistics department at Brown, we have a biostatistics core for the lead study. Uh, so I work with my colleagues uh, at the department, um, uh, analyzing the data uh, and developing methods for looking at these uh, longitudinal comparisons between the groups uh, and for developing the biomarkers uh, for here. So here, the, in terms of the imaging data, we have uh, PET, um, MRI data, um, no fMRI yet, but um, uh, ADNI3 now has fMRI, so perhaps Leeds will at some point incorporate that too. Um, don't know. Um, and finally, uh, so in speaking of biomarkers, uh, those of you who have had um, uh, a chance to look at uh, some of the more um, recent methods that are used for prediction purposes, uh, particularly the deep learning algorithms, uh, we know that in those cases, uh, what we are often uh, thinking about is instead of having these uh, kind of more biologically driven small numbers of biomarkers, we may uh, have algorithms that churn out hundreds and thousands of biomarkers uh, for prediction. And for example, the neural networks would, we, would be one example like this, where we provide the full, for example, the full image of the um, of the uh, participant's lung in this case. And uh, we run the deep learning algorithm. It's usually a black box uh, that returns um, a, a set of biomarkers um, and we use those for prediction. Those usually don't have a, a whole lot of uh, biologically relevant or interpretable um, meanings, but uh, it, although there are some, there is some work in this area to develop um, interpretable uh, but markers from uh, what we are getting from the neural networks. Uh, but then those methods uh, have been shown to have a very good performance. So in this particular project that I'm showing here, my student Manhan did, uh, developed a, a convolutional neural network to predict survival from that same one cancer data set. So here, instead of looking at the full, at the area of the tumor, we are looking at a box containing the tumor area and providing the whole box to the algorithm from each participant to do the prediction. Um, no specific biomarkers are uh, provided here, just the full uh, image uh, from each participant. And Manhan showed that by developing this um, uh, CNN to do the prediction, we found the resulting survival predictions were better than any of the like shape feature based or histogram feature based biomarkers that we were able to look at um, uh, with the existing methods. So the question is which one is better? And I would here perhaps go back to the to my original question. So the idea the, the question is what is the goal? So if we are interested in treatment effects, we may want to have biomarkers, for example, that would be able to differentiate the groups. But if we are interested in survival predictions like this, we may uh, choose to use methods that are giving us the best prediction method rather than focusing on interpretability of the results. Uh, so again, they are, these are not necessarily either or. Uh, there are 
people who work on interpretable machine learning um, methods, for example, uh, and there are some uh, attempts to do that in the deep learning area. Uh, so, uh, but uh, it, generally for this type of analysis, uh, it's uh, so, so it's important to think about the goals throughout the, uh, the analysis and throughout the steps uh, of the process. 